As was just mentioned, the title for tonight's class is In a World of Uncertainty, What Are We to Do? And you think for a moment about the world in which we live, our lives, the people in this world, and there's a fair amount of uncertainty. You just think about the things that we see on a regular basis. At a personal level, there's a fair amount of uncertainty with our health. Maybe we feel uncertainty with our job or family situation, whatever the dynamic may be for us personally. You expand that a bit to a societal or a global perspective. And we know the uncertainty that continues to spin around the different waves of the pandemic. Political upheavals are taking place as we look around the world. Our ability to travel, to visit loved ones. There's a fair amount of economic uncertainty. How much longer can things continue to go up before they crash? There's a fair amount of social inequity, supply chain issues. We take a look at the Middle East and we can see what's going on there. The uncertainty around Iran. When are they going to get the nuclear bomb? And all the uncertainty that's taking place with God's people of Israel. And if you think too long about it, it can become rather stressful to think about all the things that are taking place that are seemingly out of our control. And what do people do around us when things are uncertain? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us about the end times and when things would be uncertain and the reaction of the people in the world when those things are occurring. We read about that in Luke chapter 21, verses 25 and 26, where our Lord says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And so we can see this fear. We can even feel this fear as perhaps we ourselves struggle with some of the things that are taking place. But despite the uncertainty, by and large, what our Lord tells us is that people will continue doing what they've always been doing. We can read that in Luke chapter 17, verses 26 to 28, where our Lord tells us that it would be like in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, where people are buying and selling, marrying and giving in marriage, continuing on as they always have. The reality is that the uncertain times that we're living in are leading to a certain end. So what does the Bible tell us to do in uncertain times? What's the counsel that we're given there? Well, this question has been asked by the myriads of the stock of humanity throughout time, those who have come before us. And when we see uncertainty, when we experience inequity, what are we supposed to do? Well, interestingly, this very question comes up in the Bible. People who were living in times of uncertainty asked this very question of the apostles of what are we supposed to do? And the great thing for us is that not only is the question recorded, but the answer is also recorded for us. And I really appreciate it when the answer key is provided. I'm sure anyone thinking back to their school days can appreciate that as well, of when we get the answer key along with the questions that are provided to us. In Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to, 30 to 41, is a very, very important period in the history of the early ecclesia. That's when this question was asked and when it was answered. And so just dial back in your minds in time about 2,000 years ago after the resurrection of Jesus. And that's when Acts 2 is taking place. Peter, the apostle, is giving the first big sermon of the new Christian church, or Christian ecclesia. And he's doing it in Jerusalem. Thousands were gathered to him in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. In fact, some estimate that there would have been about a million Jews at that time in the city. And Peter goes into a fair amount of detail about how just 50 days earlier, they had put the Son of God to death by crucifying him. And as the crowd gathered and listened to these words, they were convicted in their hearts, their conscience smote them, and they knew that something had to be done. And we read about that in Acts 2 and verse 37. It says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? That's the big question that needs to be answered. And what's fascinating is to see what Peter tells them. Did Peter go on to tell them to start a big anti-government movement? Did he tell them to start up a social justice campaign or to begin a series of protests that you needed to go and overthrow the religious leaders at the time because they were completely debunked 
or that they needed to cast off the oppressive Roman authority. That seems to be the approach around us today to start up a movement to fix all the issues that we see around us. But that's not the advice that Peter gives here in Acts chapter 2. The advice of scripture isn't to set about trying to fix everyone else and everything else. No, that's not really the focus that Peter gives to us. Instead, Peter tells them that they need to focus on fixing themselves. Get yourself in the right place. Live your life in the right way. And then you'll be in a position for God to use you when he's going to fix the circumstances that we see around us. When he fixes the things around us by establishing a new world order. Just think about for a moment in terms of where the power to affect real change is actually at. Just think about two simple scenarios. Scenario number one is I spend a lot of time researching all the issues around me and thinking about all the areas where other people need to improve. I dissect society. I dissect the people in society, the people that are around me, and I can put my finger exactly on what's wrong with everything else and everyone else around me. But for all the energy that I employ in doing that and thinking through all the issues with everyone else and everything else, what's actually happening? What change am I really affecting? Well, not a whole lot other than stressing myself out because no matter how much I think about changing all the other things outside myself, the sheer thought of it doesn't really accomplish a whole lot. But think now about scenario number two, that I hold a mirror up to my own life and I focus on becoming a better person myself. I think about all the ways that I can improve, the ways that I can grow. And then I take real action to go after those areas in my life. And if I spend time and effort in that regard, do you think that I'll have a greater impact, greater results than in the first scenario of identifying all the things that are wrong around me? But you just think through where it is that we see the focus in mainstream media today. It's all about identifying the issues with everyone else. And it's so easy to get sucked into that and to focus on all the externalities that seem to be outside of our control, all the uncertainties that if everybody else could just get their act together, then this world would be a better place. But Jesus says, well, why don't you focus on getting the plank out of your own eye before you focus on trying to remove the speck out of your brother's eye? It's way too easy for us to focus on fixing everyone else and everything else outside of ourselves. Well, Peter is instructing us to be the change that we want to see in the world around us. And this applies to every aspect of life. And these are things I need to tell myself at times of thinking about all the instruction that I have for the kids, all the constructive feedback. Well, what if I was to focus more effort on being the adult that I'd like them to become? Or instead of telling our spouses all the things that we don't like about them, focus on being the spouse that we'd love to have. Instead of complaining about what's wrong with all the leaders in the government, focus on being the leader that we would want to be or that we would love to have. And instead of starting up a movement to change everyone else, to fully invest in a movement to change ourselves. But where does this movement begin? Well, it begins with asking ourselves the question, what purpose am I trying to create? What results am I trying to achieve? In other words, what is seeking first the kingdom and God's righteousness look in every situation in my life? What's it look like in this specific situation that I'm encountering? And then based on that, based on really asking ourselves that question and giving ourselves an honest answer, asking ourselves the next question, which is, well, what should I do? What should I do about it? And then having the courage to actually do something. But what is that something that we're supposed to do? And quite often, that's where we can begin to freewheel a bit as we try to articulate and put our finger exactly on what it is that we're supposed to be doing. We know that we're supposed to be doing something, but something's pretty nebulous. And we can know intuitively that something needs to change, but never take the time to define what something is. Instead, we press forward doing the same things that we've always done, somehow hoping that we're going to get a different result. But as the saying goes, if we do things that we've always done, then we're just going to keep getting what we've always got.
And deep down inside, we know that to be the case. We know that continuing on with status quo is insufficient and in really obtaining the change that we're looking for. And what this tends to do is create anxiety within us of where we know that something needs to change. We don't really articulate what that is. And so as a result, we continue on doing the same things, getting the same results and feeling more and more frustrated that we're not making the progress that we'd like to make. Well, what is that something that we're expected to do? These steps apply to us and they apply to our interested friends as well. Because the advice that Peter gives is really all about being brilliant at the basics. It's not something that's in depth. It's not a monumental change that we need to make. It is just this huge thing that needs to happen. But what Peter's talking about is being brilliant at the basics and doing it consistently. Let's take a look at what it is that Peter instructs that there is a need for a significant change. But that significant change is then followed by consistent things done over time. If we read in the record here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, note what Peter says to them. They've come to him and said, look, what are we supposed to do? And Peter says, this is what you need to do. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what he says in verse 38. Nothing groundbreaking to us as we've learned and known the truth for a number of years, perhaps in many cases, or even if we're newly learning it. These are not complex things of repent and being baptized. But think about what repentance really means. It's a combination of two things. One is being sorry for what we've done. And the second piece is actually changing our behavior to do something different as a result. It's not enough to simply be sorry for what we've done, to feel really bad about it, and then to go on and do the exact same thing the next day, to not really make any changes. That's not what God's looking for. We have to be sorry and then follow it up with real change. Just think about our own lives, for example. How many of us really like it when somebody says, yeah, I'm really sorry, and then we don't really see any effort to change? It's, it comes across as disingenuous. It doesn't have the desired effect. And it's not really what God's looking for either. If we take a look at Joel chapter 2 and verse 13, and just flip back there for a moment, what we find is that God was struggling with this aspect with his people. Joel chapter 2 and verse 13 of what it was that real repentance looked like to him. Joel chapter 2 and verse 13, he says, and rend your heart and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. And so he says two things to rend your heart, that we have to genuinely be sorry, that it's not a superficial thing, but it's something that we feel on the inside. And then we have to change our behavior, return unto the Lord our God. It's both of these steps together, genuinely being sorry, and then changing course, changing direction to do something different. But for us to get to the point of repentance, it means that we have to have an admission of wrongdoing. There has to be that motivation within us because if somehow we minimize the impact of what we've done, then the motivation to make real change goes away because if it's not really that bad, if there's some explanation for why we did the wrong thing that pertains to another brother or sister, or a member of my family that put me in this situation, then I'm not feeling the motivation to change. I'm not really admitting that the problem squarely rests with me, with my response, with my behavior, the things that are within my control. And so we have to be willing, first and foremost, to admit that there's a problem, to say, I've messed up. That yes, there's a lot of things around me that could use improvement, but I've messed up, that I need to improve. And so this aspect of repentance is key, to first be willing to admit that we have a problem, and to do so with humility, to not say, I have a problem, but, and then look to somebody else, but to say, I have a problem, full stop, and to be willing to look at ourselves and see what it is that needs to change. But what comes next after we get to that point? And it's not a point that we get to at one point in our lives, but continually of where we need to examine ourselves but what about what Peter says here, this aspect of repentance? He says the next aspect is baptism. But why is that? Well, what's baptism all about? 
Well, it's a commitment to make a change and to do something better. When someone's baptized, they go under the water, they come back up. And scripture tells us that this represents a burial and a rising again, a resurrection to a new way of life. And this is what we're going to do about it. This is what we do about being repentant, about changing direction. And when we are baptized, we're making a commitment to God to do something different, to associate ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and the way that he lived his life. So know where the focus is. It's not on transforming everyone else's lives. It's not on changing everyone else, changing everything else. The focus that Peter's talking about here is on changing ourselves. And when we do this, Peter says that we're forgiven for our sins. When we repent and we're baptized. But is this the end of the process? That believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved and then we're finished? Well, of course we know that's not the case. That this is the first step in the process. It's the beginning. It's getting over the starting line of entering the race. It's a commitment to transform. But this is a common problem, a common issue, a trap that people fall into in life. And we can fall into the same trap of where we recognize that there's an issue. And we say, all right, well, what am I going to do about it? And we set a goal. And just that mere aspect of setting a goal can be somewhat therapeutic because we've identified that we need to do something different. But sometimes what happens is the setting of a goal can unconsciously be mistaken with the achieving of that goal, as though somehow the expression of our pursuit into words has somehow actualized our pursuit into existence. And when this happens, our motivation dissolves and we end up doing nothing. I'm sure in a couple months time, we'll experience that with a number of people around us, maybe even ourselves as New Year's resolutions begin to flow in. And that just the setting of those goals seems to be pretty significant. But where's the follow through? What happens as a result? Where's the action consistency? Well, this is where the next aspect comes in of what it is that the believers continued in over time. They received the gospel with joy, and they did four simple things that I'd like to talk about together. And these four simple things can make a really big difference in our lives if we do them consistently. And we find these four simple things in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And this is really where we're going to spend the rest of our time together, is looking at these four simple things that make a big difference. When we're living in a world of uncertainty, what are the things that we can do? And Kelly and I started taking a look at this about six months into the pandemic and just trying to figure out what's the point of all of this and how can we keep our heads in the right place? Because we found that it was very, very difficult to keep our heads in the right place. And we wanted to know from a scriptural perspective, what are the things that we can be doing? And so when we take a look at these aspects, the first thing that's mentioned in Acts 2 and verse 42 is that of doctrine. So let's just read Acts 2 and verse 42, and then we'll take a look at each of these elements for ourselves and try to drill down as to the, the practical application for ourselves. It says that after there were added 3,000 souls, so 3,000 people were convicted in their conscience to be baptized and to say, I'm going to make a change. What is it that they did? Well, it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking in bread and prayers. They continued steadfastly. They were consistent in these things. And the first thing that's mentioned is doctrine. Doctrine is believing and teaching the right things. And we can see in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 that this was a problem that God faced with his people. Of where he said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They didn't have the fundamental understanding. It had slipped away over the course of time. And it's so important that we serve God in sincerity and in truth. We see a lot of focus a lot of times in modern Christianity on sincerity, that my heart's in it. But if we don't have this aspect of truth, if we're not consistently taking in the word of God, then we'll be sincere but we'll be sincerely wrong, and we won't be pleasing to our Heavenly Father with what it is that he's desiring of us. And so where does truth come from? Well, we know from Romans 10 and verse 17 that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 
And so when you think about the application for ourselves, the application is rather simple. Pick up the Bible each day and read it. And maybe we start with something simple. Maybe it's just starting with one chapter a day and doing that one chapter consistently of progressing ourselves through the Bible. Perhaps we read all three portions of the daily readings. But if we find that we're in a position of where we're really struggling to be consistent, start with one. And when you read it, think about it. Spend the time on it. Think about how much time our society spends on electronics, phones, tablets, computers, maybe even TVs. What if we were to just carve out some of that time each day to read at least one chapter of the Bible? It's interesting when you talk to interested friends and you talk about something simple like this. This is something that's obtainable. It's something that's achievable. It's something that can be sustained of just reading a little bit each day. The second aspect that's mentioned is fellowship, which is building relationships with others based on God's word. We know some well-known passages like Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 and 10, that two are better than one because they have a good reward for the labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. It's a very practical benefit for us to spend time with others who are trying to go to the same place that we are in life. None of us can do it alone. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 is another good one which I'm sure that we've all felt the weight of, as you think about the issues and the days in which we're living, of where we're told to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, but to exhort one another, and to do so daily, and all the more as we see the day approaching. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33, to be not deceived that evil company corrupts good morals that hanging out with the wrong type of people, not surrounding ourselves with the right type of people, can move us off the pathway that we desire to be on. And so who are we spending our time with? Are they helping us toward the kingdom? Or is it resulting in us moving further away? Are we prioritizing building relationships? Are we externally focused and thinking about how we can build those relationships to not only help ourselves, but to help others around us? So practically speaking, what does it look like for us to prioritize spending time with others who are on the same journey that we're on and deprioritizing time with people who aren't? Like I said, these aren't complicated things, but these are the things that the believers did consistently that had big results when looked at over time. The third one was breaking of bread, remembering Jesus, what it is that Jesus has accomplished our commitment to him, our commitment to live like him, and the great hope that we have through what has been accomplished. We've done that this morning. We read of the instruction of that in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 25. What's that look like, practically speaking? Well, it means prioritizing, going to meeting each week to remember Jesus in the way that he's commanded. And when we're there, to actually be present, physically present, mentally present, to be checked in when it comes time to actually remember our Lord Jesus Christ and to not be distracted with all the other things that are going on around us. And the fourth piece pertains to prayers, our, which is our relationship with God. We read about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, where we're told to pray without ceasing, we know from James chapter 5 and verse 16 that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so if doctrine or if reading is God speaking with us, then prayer is us speaking to God. It completes that circle of two-way communication, and it's vital in the life of a believer. And so the practical application is commit to saying one intentional prayer each day. We know the model of Daniel three different prayers, three different times. But outside of meals, which perhaps many of us are accustomed to praying for, how does our prayer life look? Is it consistent? Is it intentional? Are we actually thinking about what we're saying? Or do we fall into the trap of repetition or falling in and out of focus as we're trying to pray to our Heavenly Father? What would it look like for us to commit to 
to saying one intentional prayer each day. And so personally, what Kelly and I did is we took a look at this and said, okay, but what does this mean for us? And so what we were doing initially is getting about on the day and, and coming back later and doing a reading with the family after dinner and trying to prioritize these things. But we said, well, what would it mean to start our day? To rise up early as Abraham did and to prioritize these things. What if we, before we got the day going, just read one chapter together and said a meaningful prayer, a prayer that was modeled after the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, and really began our day. And we found it really only takes 20 minutes, which isn't a huge investment of time to be able to say a prayer and to read a reading and to have at least some discussion on it. Maybe a bit longer if the discussion becomes more involved, but this is something that any of us can do. And we found that over time it had a very big impact of putting our minds in the right place. Because just like if we're not eating the right food physically, we begin to feel the effects of that. If we're not con consuming the right food spiritually and doing so consistently, we also feel the impact of that. But what does meaningful prayer really look like? I think that's something that many of us struggle with, of where there may be times when we're more focused and times when we fall out of focus. And so I just wanted to spend a few moments delving into this last one of prayer in a little bit more detail to try to give ourselves a better understanding, or at least remind ourselves of the understanding that we already have based on the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. The Lord instructs us in Matthew chapter 6 of how it is that we ought to pray. And I think he does so because he knows that it's difficult. In fact, even after he gives the initial structure of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, his disciples come back to him and they say, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he recites the prayer, at least a summary again for them, because he knew how hard it was for them to be able to pray and to do so consistently. And so one of the things that he says at the outset is that prayer is between us and God, that it's a relationship builder as we pursue a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And as we take a look at each of these phrases within the Lord's Prayer, it's worth pausing and considering the impact and the import to us. The prayer starts out, our Father in heaven. It's very easy for us to rattle that off and to not really think about the significance of what's contained within that introduction to the Lord's Prayer. There's really three aspects that come out, which is our relationship with God, our position before God, and our mindfulness of his family. Think about this first one of our relationship with God, of a parent and child relationship, our Father who is in heaven. And at its simplest level, it's a recognition that he is the parent and that we are the child. And therefore, we follow the will of the parent, that the parent knows what's best. We know from Jewish society that the child was always in a lesser position than the parent, no matter what level of greatness the child rose to, that the parent was always in the supreme position. And so by simply acknowledging that God is our father, we have the recognition of he is the parent, we are the child, but also the great privilege that we have to be able to refer to the creator of the universe as our father. And the fact that he's in heaven brings out the second aspect, which is our position before him as it pertains to heaven versus earth, that as high as the heaven is above the earth, so are my ways than thy ways, is what God tells us. And so if we ever doubt in life as we're going through as to why are things happening, or we begin to question, are things happening for the right reasons, we can rest assured that God's ways are higher than our ways, and that he understands, and though we may not be able to see the big picture from our vantage point, where we're currently at, that he can, that he knows, and we can have that recognition and that confidence. And the third aspect is by calling God our Father, it's a recognition that we are a part of his collective family, and that the only reason that God is our Father is because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ never instructs his disciples to pray to God as my Father. That was a, a title that was reserved for Jesus alone as he prayed to his Father. He talks about my father, but 
God is only our father because of the adoption that we have through Christ. And therefore, when we approach God, we need to be mindful of the rest of his family and how it is that we're treating the other members of his family. And just as we as parents wouldn't tolerate it if our own children were being cruel or vindictive or unkind to each other, so too our Heavenly Father delights in when we are kind to the rest of the members of his family. And it brings to mind our responsibility to the rest of God's family. The next phrase that comes up after this introduction of our Father in heaven is, hallowed be thy name. And when you look at the Greek, the verb actually comes first of hallowed be thy name, come thy kingdom, done thy will, that God's purpose comes first. It's not just an immediate outpouring of all the problems that I have and all the things that I am unhappy with, but there's a recognition that God comes first, that everything that we're about to pray is according to his will, that we desire for his name to be made separate, to made holy that we look forward to the time when his righteousness will fill this earth, when the kingdom comes as being the time when his will truly is going to be manifest in the earth and when the earth will be filled with his glory as the waters cover the sea. And a fundamental question for us in our approach to God is does God exist to fulfill the needs and desires of people or do people exist to fulfill the desires of God? An insight into our personal philosophy comes when we answer the following. When God doesn't do what we're asking for or what we expect, how does this impact our view of God or our commitment to him? Are we here to serve God or does God exist to serve us? And if God is thought of merely as a convenience, then it's not men who serve God, but God who serves men. And if we've unwittingly espoused a view of where God exists to serve us, to fulfill our desires, then what we'll find is that we're getting upset when our prayers don't seem to be answered in the way that we desire, that we begin to feel despondent, that we begin to become disenfranchised when it comes to God, when things do become difficult. And so what we have here, what Jesus tells us, is the need for us to prioritize God's will not only in our prayers, but in our lives. And when service becomes hard, or we struggle to see the benefit in the present, how does this impact our commitment? The hallowing of God's name can't be our desire for the future unless it already molds our present. And so with that recognition of our position before God, our relationship with God, the desire to prioritize his will and the accomplishment of it in our lives. Next comes three aspects, these three phrases that speak about the disciples' dependence upon God in every aspect of life. First, in regards to physical life, then in regard to spiritual life, and third, in the strength to overcome trial. He says, give us this day our daily bread, the dependence upon God for physical life of simply acknowledging God for the food that we have to eat, for the clothes on our back that day, for the shelter that we have over our heads, for the measure of health that he's provided in that day to be able to serve him. How often do we take the time to deliberately thank God for the simple things in life? Or do we just move on to all the other big things of life that seem to be challenging us? Do we consider that physical need is the basis for spiritual life, that life itself is required to develop in the character of God? Sister Pat was talking about 61 years of development, and we know that it's a lifetime of development for each of us. But without the life that we have, we'd be deprived of the opportunity to develop in the character of God. And where there is no life, there can be no growth. And so the prayer of our Lord, therefore, acknowledges our dependence upon God for the very elements that form the foundation of our consciousness, and therefore of all of our knowledge, of all of our faith, of all of our love, of all of our hope, and hence of all of the opportunity that we have to develop a character 
that will be fit for God's kingdom. The phrase itself is really interesting when you consider the meaning, because there's different opinions on how it ought to be understood. But one prominent scholar, his name was uh, Adolf Deisman, who was um, a student of papyri at the time, says that there was actually a, a rendering that would be better understood based on what he found in the remains of a, a housekeeper's book. And he believes that this word that's used here most probably referred to the daily amount of food that was given to slaves or to other laborers. And it was actually allotted the day before. So the day before it was needed, it was provided to that servant. And he says, the strict meaning of the prayer is, give us today our amount of daily food for tomorrow. And that's in his book, The New Testament in the Light of Modern Research. Give us today our amount of daily food for tomorrow. And this parallels the depiction of the faithful and wise steward in Luke 12 and verse 42, who gives them their meat in due season. So think about the significance of this for a moment. It's not only the avoidance of starvation that the believer is instructed to pray for, but the allotment of what's needed for the following day. Now, why would that matter? Well, I believe what Jesus is instructing us here on in the need to pray for the food of tomorrow, the needs of tomorrow, is that if we know that tomorrow is taken care of, if we have faith that God is going to provide for the needs of tomorrow, then that frees up our minds to focus on the opportunities of today, the opportunities that are right in front of us. But what can happen to us is our minds freewheel. They become filled with anxiety and we focus on all the issues that might be in the future. And it robs us of the opportunities to really lean into today and to see what is God trying to teach me today with the opportunities that are here right now. Jesus then transitions to the second need, which is our need and dependence upon him for spiritual life. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And just as we can't live without physical nourishment, so too we can't live apart from being forgiven by God. Because without God's forgiveness, there's no fellowship with God. And without fellowship, we ultimately have no life at all. We're simply doomed to the grave and the commensurate disintegration into the dust that follows. And this is the sentiment that's expressed by Paul in Ephesians 2 and verse 1, where he says that before Christ, they were dead in trespasses and sins. And that's when we're without forgiveness, as he says in Ephesians 2 and verse 12, and therefore without hope. But for us to receive forgiveness, there's this key element that the Lord includes here that we would be very wise to include in our daily prayers, which is as we forgive our debtors. There's a realization that we have to have the humility to forgive other people if we ourselves want to be forgiven. And so Jesus ties those two elements together. And it's worth us asking ourselves the question of what are we holding on to with other people? Have we truly forgiven others? And is the forgiveness that we extend to others what we hope to achieve or obtain from our Heavenly Father in his mercy? Of all the phrases in the Lord's Prayer, this phrase is the one that he goes on in Matthew 6 verses 14 to 15 to expound upon further that after he finishes delivering the Lord's prayer, Jesus actually expounds on the need to forgive in more detail because he knows how difficult it is for us to forgive. And so continually praying to God concerning our need for forgiveness and of our need to forgive others really helps to remind us of our position before God. Naturally, what happens is our tendency is to minimize the severity of the things that we've done and maximize the fault of others. And we produce explanations to help justify our behaviors, to somehow make us feel better about doing the wrong thing. But this connection by Jesus forces us to be mindful that forgiveness is not via explanation, but through personal repentance combined with a willingness to forgive others. The debt that we owe to God is without measure. We see this in the parable of the unforgiving servant at the end of Matthew chapter 18. For those who we feel owe us an apology, but we know what we owe to God can never be repaid. And so Jesus is reminding us here that when we pray, 
we ought to remember that our forgiveness is dependent upon the mercy that we show to others. So these new opportunities are what Jesus transitions to next in the prayer, the new opportunities to develop through the trials of life. But he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. He's covered our dependence upon God for physical life, for spiritual life, and for the strength now to overcome trial. And with this phrase, we imagine in our minds a, a small child that's being led by a parent. And you can see the implicit trust that a child has in the parent, that no matter what's going on around them, as long as they're holding the hand of their parent, they're able to go through anything. Meanwhile, the parent might be extremely scared at what's taking place, but the child, the child has confidence that as long as they're with the parent, the parent will lead them and they will hold hands. The child trusts that their parent will lead them in the right direction. Well, each of us has weaknesses that we're tempted with. And in this appeal, we're praying that God will limit the instances of where he allows us to be in circumstances of where we'll find ourselves to be tempted. But we know invariably that this is going to happen, that it's part of the development that we face, and that subsequently we have to overcome our weaknesses. And we do so not in our own strength, but in the strength of our Heavenly Father. And James speaks to us of the inevitability of this fact. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, where he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And so he doesn't say that we should be happy that we have problems, but that we should be joyful knowing what those issues are working toward. Now, he doesn't say go and jump into temptations. He says when you fall into diverse temptations. Falling is not something that we try to do. Falling is something that happens to us. It's a circumstance, a situation that we find ourselves in. We don't go looking for it, but we may fall into it. And when this occurs, we're being reminded that we need to place our faith and our trust, our confidence in God. Because an inward self-sufficiency is more destructive than any outward temptation that we could face. And why is this? Well, he continues on in the same verse, well, actually in a different verse, in Matthew 26 and verse 41, to say that the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is the point that we're dependent upon God for the strength to overcome trial. And so these three elements are critical for us as we think about our prayer life, our dependence upon God for our physical life, for our spiritual life, and for the strength to overcome trial, for our daily needs, our health, our food, our clothing, our shelter, those physical needs that we depend on God each day, and we put that at God's feet to take care of. That yes, we try to be good stewards, but we don't stress about those things. We don't become anxious about them because we know that God's in control, that God is definitely needed for our spiritual life, that we depend on him for that, and that we depend upon God for the strength to overcome trial. And Christ concludes his prayer in the same way that he began, that thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. That just as Jesus began the prayer with the focus on his heavenly father, and the accomplishing of his will, so too the prayer in the life of the believer circles back to this in daily life. And so this prayer can be a template for us as we try to offer meaningful prayers to our Heavenly Father, as we think through our brothers and sisters, and we weave into this structure the needs of others, what it is that they're going through, and we go through the ecclesial directory in our minds of how is brother so-and-so doing, or sister so-and-so, and, -so, and the, the situations that they're enduring. And we think through that very deliberately. Sometimes we don't know what to pray for each day, but by having a structure, it helps to guide our prayers as we do so before our Heavenly Father. Well, let's come back now to Acts chapter 2, circling back and remembering those four things that we were instructed to do by Peter or that the believers in the early days were doing. They were reading each day. They were forming relationships that would support them. They were breaking bread, remembering Jesus each week in the way that was appointed. And they were praying to God consistently. 
just consider for a moment the results that came as a result of them doing these things consistently over time. It says in Acts 2 and verse 43, fear came upon every soul. Everyone had a healthy respect for God. There were many wonders and signs that were done by the apostles. They could visibly see God working in their lives. And the same thing exists for us. No, we may not have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but if we're tuned in, if we're respecting God, if we're looking for his hand in our lives, then we will see God working in our lives. We will hear that still small voice if we drown out and if we minimize the sound of the noise around us. They freely shared with each other in verses 44 to 45. They created a common pool of resource and shared with each other because they realized everything that they had was God's. And therefore, they were expected to be good stewards and to distribute to each other. They were unified in mind in verse 46. They had a common purpose and a common approach, and that led to unity, something that we would love to have. They were filled with praise and joy in verses 46 and 47. And the Lord added to the ecclesia daily. The ecclesia continued to grow, as we see in verse 47. Small things done faithfully over time have a big impact. And similarly, small things neglected over time have a big impact. These things are not complicated. They're very simple. Reading, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. It's okay to start small and to be consistent in those small things. But what's not okay is to stop doing the small things. Yet these are quite often the things that we walk away from when the going gets tough. Just consider as we bring our comments to a close, some of the words of our brother Robert Roberts, where he says, an enlightened man will not wait until he can do a great thing. If a man waits until he can do a great thing, he will never do anything. Do little things faithfully, and these may grow into great. Things that are considered great are made up of many littles. And a man who scorns the little will never reach the great. We live in a time and in a world of uncertainty. But the end is certain. We don't know the day or the hour. But we do know that this world is heading down a path that will end with the Lord Jesus Christ's return. That no, the earth itself will not be destroyed. But a new world order will be established in which righteousness reigns and in which God's glory fills the earth. The appeal to us is real, to repent and to be baptized, and to make sure that we are continuing in the simple things, that we are brilliant at the basics of reading the Bible, of fellowship, of building up relationships to help each other as we walk toward the kingdom, of remembering our Lord Jesus Christ in the way appointed, and in building our relationship with our Heavenly Father, praying each day. What would that look like to us? What's the sustainability of our discipleship? What are the simple things that we need to be doing each day to progressively work toward the kingdom? Jesus tells us to live one day at a time. Yes, we need to be wise, but he tells us to live one day at a time. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So let's make sure that we're making the most of each day, that we're redeeming the time. And we're consistent in the simple things as we await the return of our Lord Jesus Christ.